Hi, I'm Antonia. This is Universally Me. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Antonia Carlotta and support my work by becoming a member of the Lemley family on Patreon. Members that are mummy tier and above get exclusive access to my Universally Mini podcast that has news from Universal, from the horror community, the classic film world, and more that didn't make this video. And all members of the Lemley family get exclusive access to bonus posts, plus pictures and memorabilia from my family's private collection. Mary Pickford is one of the most famous actresses in old Hollywood, and she's so much more than just a silent actress. Like, so much more. I think I've been pretty intimidated to make this video because I want to be sure to do her justice and capture just how much of an influential figure she was in the early days of Hollywood. My uncle Carl Lemley and Mary Pickford worked together and they knew each other well. And I'd say they had a couple adventures in their working relationship too. I'm really excited to share those with you, but first we should start all the way at the beginning. Let's meet Mary Pickford. Mary Pickford was born Gladys Marie Smith on April 8, 1892 in Toronto, Ontario, Canada to parents John Charles Smith and Charlotte Hennessy. Mary had two younger siblings, Charlotte, whom everybody called Lottie, and John Charles, who would be known as Jack. In many ways, Mary never had the chance to have a real childhood. Her father was an alcoholic who abandoned the family pretty soon after Jack was born. And about a year and a half later, when Mary was six, he would pass away in a work accident. Mary's mother was absolutely paralyzed with grief, but then Jack got sick. And now with medical bills and a family to pay for, they had to figure something out. Mary's mom started sewing and she took in boarders to help pay the bills. One of the boarders was a theatrical manager and he suggested that Mary and her sister Lottie be given some small roles on the stage. Thus began her career. By the early 1900s, the whole family was involved. They would all travel together, taking whatever roles they could get cast in. But by all accounts, Mary was always the most talented and the most ambitious too, wanting success more than anything. Mary had only a few years of formal education and instead did what she could to learn while she was touring. She had many long train rides where she taught herself to read and she developed unparalleled street smarts. As a preteen, she could find her way around a new city, negotiate a rate for room and board, and she earned and saved as much money as she could to send back to her family. You have to remember, this is like 1904, 1905, so not very many women, let alone young girls, were able to live like this. In 1907, at 15 years old, Mary finally secured her first Broadway role working with David Belasco in the Warrens of Virginia. The story of her tenacity to get that role tells you so much about her, and I tell that story in my Mary Pickford Universally Mini on Patreon. It was also about this time that she changed her name from Gladys Marie Smith to Mary Pickford, and the rest of her family followed suit, changing their names to Pickford as well. I have to imagine that despite her innate charisma and ambition, it must have been tough for Mary to feel responsible for her family and to have so much pressure of everybody counting on her. I think about it in relation to child stars today where teenagers or even kids miss out on their childhood for a family that's financially dependent on them. And I guess given all that, I'm surprised that Mary made it out as well as she did. Mary performed with the Warrens of Virginia for about two years and with her run wrapping up, she approached D.W. Griffith at Biograph Studios in search of a job until her next theater gig began. She was nervous to be seen in the Biograph offices, worried that somebody from the theater might see her and get her in trouble, or that they might look down on her for considering such a new form of entertainment that was still seen as lower class and just a fad. But just as she had done with Velasco, Mary managed to charm D.W. Griffith with her intelligence and wit, and he hired her on for $10 a week. At the time, the highest paid actress at Biograph was Florence Lawrence, who was known as the Biograph Girl. And in a hilarious story that I have shared on my channel before, 
my uncle Carl Lemley then stole Florence Lawrence from Biograph to work at his independent moving pictures company. This really couldn't have worked out any better for Mary as now there was an open position and she got to be the next Biograph girl. Working with D.W. Griffith at Biograph was great training for Mary. He was paid a bonus for every foot of film produced and it could get expensive to do too many reshoots, so films were churned out quickly. Mary learned to play to a camera instead of an audience and D.W. Griffith taught her acting tricks to make her performances more realistic. Mary Pickford was really popular with audiences. If you said the Biograph Girl or the Girl with the Golden Curls, people knew who you were talking about. But though they knew her movies, they knew her face, nobody knew her name. That was the very reason Carl was able to lure Florence Lawrence away from Biograph, and that would be how he got Mary Pickford too. He promised her name billing and he promised to make her a star. Now at the same time, Mary Pickford had started dating actor Owen Moore, whom she had met the previous year working at Biograph. Mary's mother was wary of the relationship because Owen had a reputation for drinking and for treating women poorly. And Mary's mother thought that she would be better off focusing on her work. This may have added to Mary's decision to take the job at IMP where her salary would almost double to $175 a week and she could show her mom just how seriously she was taking her work. Uncle Carl also hired Charlotte, Lottie, and Jack for bit parts on IMP films and it didn't hurt that Owen Moore was also working at IMP, though Mary's mom did not know that at first. When Uncle Carl brought Mary Pickford to IMP, it was a pretty big win for him. First, because Mary Pickford was one of the most famous faces in the world. But second, because Biograph was one of the companies that made up Thomas Edison's trust. And you might remember that my uncle Carl and Thomas Edison were not getting along too well. Remember the time that Thomas Edison sued my uncle 289 times? It was actually pretty dangerous of my uncle Carl to be running an independent studio fighting Thomas Edison, trying to stay clear of Edison's lackeys who would have no qualms about destroying his entire life, and then to take one of his biggest movie stars on top of that, nay, two of his biggest movie stars on top of that, Carl needed a plan to keep his productions running smoothly. In January of 1911, Mary and Owen got secretly married, and around the same time, IMP moved its productions from Fort Lee, New Jersey to Havana, Cuba. Mary, Owen, and her whole family made the voyage. IMP's trek to Cuba provided some safety, security, and distance from Thomas Edison. Plus, the winter weather was much better in Cuba than New Jersey. Unfortunately, it didn't allow for Mary and Owen to keep their wedding a secret for very long. And a few days into the trip, Mary's mother discovered her with Owen, and she was furious and it caused a ton of tension for everybody in Cuba. Their time in Cuba ended early anyway, as Owen got in a fist fight with Thomas Ince's assistant and the police were called. Mary joined Owen on the ship back to the US, and as 1911 wrapped, she was poached once again, this time by the new Majestic Motion Picture Company, who offered her $225 a week and agreed to sign Owen as well. Mary and Owen's relationship was troubled, to say the least, and as Mary's star continued to soar, Owen's was at a standstill at best. Mary encouraged him to direct, hoping that the promotion would build his confidence and save their marriage, but instead he used his new position to berate her and put her down in front of others. By 1914, Mary has tried, but she now sees how incompatible she and Owen are. They moved to Los Angeles, sometimes living together and sometimes living apart. It's crazy to realize that now after all of this life, all of this career that Mary has had, she is just 22 years old. In 1916, at 24 years old, Mary became one of the first movie stars to start her own production company, which she called the Mary Pickford Film Corporation. All of her films were to be distributed by famous players Lasky, which would soon take over Paramount. 
Around the same time, she also met Douglas Fairbanks for the first time at a friend's party and they became instant friends and then just a little bit more. It's possible their friendship would have ended at just a friendship. But when the U.S. reached out to Hollywood for help promoting Liberty Bonds, Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, and Charlie Chaplin all agreed to sign on. They traveled by train to major rallies across the country. By the time they returned, there was no doubt about it. Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks were in love. But wait, I must pause the love story because Mary just had so much going on all the time. And in 1919, something really important happened. Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, Charlie Chaplin, and D.W. Griffith started United Artists. Mary, Charlie, and Douglas were pretty much the three biggest stars in Hollywood, and the massive crowds that they saw while touring the country selling Liberty Bonds probably solidified that for them. With every career move, Mary had increased her power, her popularity, and her salary, but now studios were looking for ways to take that back. They wanted more creative control and they didn't want to be paying such high salaries. They were also block booking, which meant when they distributed films, they would say, hey, we've got this great Mary Pickford film for you, but you also have to buy these other five movies. And Mary Pickford was frustrated because some theaters couldn't afford to screen her films because they were too expensive attached to all these other movies. And she was also frustrated that she was being used to sell these other movies and she wasn't getting anything for it. United Artists was a way to give the power back to the artists instead of letting the big studios run the show. Now, let's get back to Douglas and Mary. They were not only business partners, but they had become life partners. But it would never just be that easy, would it? Because Mary was still married to Owen Moore. And Douglas? He was married to Annabeth Sully. Douglas would get a divorce in 1918, and in 1920, Mary Pickford would trek to Nevada to officially divorce Owen Moore. Their fans were already on to their budding relationship, and they were only encouraged every time they saw them together. United Artists, the Liberty Bonds, but Mary and Douglas would always insist they were just friends. With their divorces finalized, Mary and Douglas got married in 1920 and decided to take their relationship public. This was an especially big risk for Mary, who, as America's wholesome sweetheart, really risked her career by going public. Fortunately, the world was ecstatic. Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks lived up to their golden reputation. They spent every night together for seven years. They were the first celebrities to put their hand in footprints in the cement outside Grauman's Chinese Theater. They were always hosting parties for friends and family. They wanted to set a good example and support the communities around them. They often hosted philanthropic events together, and in 1921, Mary went one step further. With talkies coming in, putting many of her friends out of work, Mary started the Motion Picture Relief Fund to provide basic health care and social welfare services to those in the industry who were struggling. Then, in 1932, during the Great Depression, Mary introduced the Payroll Pledge Program, which deducted a small amount of studio workers' paychecks to give to others in need. In 1927, she was also one of the founding members of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. I am just so blown away at the amount that Mary was able to do and then the amount of good that she did on top of it. What an absolute icon. In the 1920s, Mary really wanted to focus on the quality of her films and only made about a film a year. And these years, she made some really great silent films. Tess of the Storm Country, Sparrows, Rosita, and My Best Girl. In 1928, she won an Oscar for Best Actress for Coquette, and she and Douglas Fairbanks had their long-awaited collaboration in 1929 in Taming of the Shrew. In 1933, after more than two decades in the film industry, she retired from acting. 
After Mary's mother passed away in 1928, Mary started drinking quite a bit, which Douglas didn't like. He would often accuse her of having affairs, though he was having affairs himself. And in 1933, after 15 years together, Mary filed for divorce from Douglas, citing mental cruelty, neglect, and indifference. Mary would stay at Pickfair, her beautiful Beverly Hills home that she shared with Douglas Fairbanks. And in 1937, she married Buddy Rogers, with whom she had worked on the film, My Best Girl. In the 1940s, she adopted two children, Roxanne and Ronald. In 1956, Mary established the Mary Pickford Charitable Trust, which after her death in 1979, became the Mary Pickford Foundation, which still exists today. They continue Mary's charitable work as well as preserve her film work and keep her memory alive. I can tell you my video today is what it is because of the Mary Pickford Foundation. They're incredible. Tell me your favorite Mary Pickford films in the comments. Make sure you catch my Universally Mini podcast on Patreon, where I talk about Mary's first meeting with David Belasco, the details of her two divorces, her relationship with D.W. Griffith, and what happened to her hair in Cuba. Make sure you follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Antonia Carlotta. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.